Hi, and welcome to this quick recording called the Pexip Installation 101, where we'll go through the installation steps of Pexip Infinity and what you need to plan for. So, in this video, we'll go through uh, a few VMware settings, how to check what CPU model you're using, and the uh, NTP time configuration. Then we'll go ahead and upload a Pexip management node and give it an IP address. Then we're going through some management settings, create a location, deploy some conference nodes, verify DNS configuration, configure the SIP TLS FQDN, upload certificates, and create a VMR. And in the end, we'll sh also show you how to do some very basic VMware maintenance, like setting up the virtual machines to automatically start when the server is booted. Prior to this installation, we expect that uh, you already have downloaded the installation files to your local computer. You have a server assigned with uh, VMware ESXi installed, and you know that it's running a proper CPU. You also have IP addresses and network assigned, uh, DNS records created, and also certificates created and provided to you, including the intermediate certificates. So let's get started. So this VMware server is running uh, Intel E5-2600 generation CPU. This is normally what we recommend and what most customers are using. This one in particular is the E5-2680 V2 running at 2.8 GHz and it has 10 cores per socket. So these are the interesting numbers to, to look for. The other thing we want to check in VMware is that the time is configured properly on the server. So going to configuration, we can find the time configuration. Here we can see that the date and time is correct and uh, the NTP server is running, or the NTP client is running. So if it's not, you can go in here, add the NTP server, check the restart after you have added it or if required, adjust the, the time close to the current time. So now the server is all good and we can get started with the deployment of the management node. So in this case, I'll go ahead and deploy the management node. This is a, an OVA file that is typically downloaded from the Pexip web page. And in this case, we're not going for the upgrade file as this is a brand new installation. And since we install on top of VMware, we'll download the instant, the uh, management node file for VMware ESXi. So going ahead and selecting the file, accepting the license and give it a name and select what data center I want to deploy into. These settings can normally be done as default. I'll stick with thick provision. And then I need to select what network this management node VM will de be deployed to. This is normally something your network admin can tell you. In this case, we're going to do a public DM set deployment. So I'm going to select the DM set network in this data center. So now you can quickly verify the different uh, details and we can go ahead and upload the management node. So this is going to take a few minutes. So as soon as the management node OVA file is uploaded to your VMware ESXi host in your data center, it will uh, automatically boot if you selected this option when completing the wizard. If not, you will manually have to start it the first time. So in this case, our management node was successfully deployed and we set it to automatically start. So it's deployed with two vCPUs and four gig RAM as default. This is something you may change if you have a very large installation, but for most customers, this will be sufficient. So when the management node has booted, we'll launch the virtual console in uh, VMware and we're ready to start the installation wizard. So in this case, I prepared a little sheet with the different IP addresses and the information we're going to need during the setup. First, I will log in as user admin. I will need to change the password. There is currently no password set. And re-enter the password. 
and now the install wizard starts. So I need to enter the password to get started with the install wizard. So first question is the IP address of the management node. And then the network mask. And the default gateway. Then the host name of the management node and the domain suffix. And then I enter the DNS servers. In this case, I'll just enter the first one. And then NTP servers. So I could go ahead and enter the NTP servers I have for my service provider, or I can just use the ones that's default with Pexip. If you want to use any default values, uh, that's shown in the brackets, you can just hit enter. There can be a separate SSH user versus the web user. So here's the username for the web admin. We'll just leave that as admin. And set a web admin password. Then confirming the web admin password. There are a couple of settings in Pexip that you need to choose during installation. These can always be changed later. The first one is incident reporting, so if something goes wrong with your uh, platform, the platform may call back to Pexip R&D and let Pexip R&D know exactly what part of the code that did not work for you. We will not see any details on who made the call to whom, etc. So normally we will reach out to you and ask you for a system snapshot so we can evaluate what went wrong in case something went wrong with your system. Normally we recommend to enable this unless you have specific privacy concerns. The second option is send deployment and usage statistics to Pexip. This is anonymous statistics on durations, protocols, so your type of deployment will influence the Pexip development. In this case, we'll go ahead and send these statistics to Pexip as well. So now the configuration we went through will be applied, the IP address will be set, and the management node will try to synchronize time. In this case, system time was set correctly, so now it's going ahead and rebooting. So now we're finished with the console for the management node. If time does not sync properly, it's normally because either DNS settings are not correct, or NTP settings are not correct, or maybe the network that was chosen during the setup in this case the DMZ network was a network which is currently not connected to the IP addresses you were using but given all network settings are correct the management node will go ahead and boot up with the new settings and it should all be okay so next step is to access the management node over the web interface it will take a few minutes from the reboot until the web is available so to conclude the remaining configuration We'll go ahead and open the management node web interface. So since it doesn't have a proper certificate yet, we need to accept this since it will always redirect us to HTTPS. So in this case, we'll log in with a web user we created during the wizard. Now we will quickly go through the different management node settings. There is not a lot of interesting stuff to look at in the status menus yet, as this is a brand new system. In the system configuration, we have the DNS settings. So we'll go ahead and add the second DNS server. Then we have NTP servers. Here we can also go ahead and add a local NTP server. If you want to, you can feed syslogs from Pexip to your own syslog server. SNMP network management systems can be configured if you prefer. 
And we can add VM managers. This is if you want Pexip to automatically deploy to your VMware ESXi hosts to simplify the deployment. This is what we will use in this case. So I'll go ahead and add my two VMware hosts directly in this case. So my first VMware host is a six core server and my second VMware host is a 20 core server so now my VM managers are added if for some reason static routes are required this can also be configured here so this is the system configuration then we'll go ahead and go into the platform configuration. First thing we'll do is to apply a license key. In Pexip, the management node, if it's available to talk to the internet, will reach out to the Pexip activation server and do online activation of the license. If this is not possible, you can check the manually activate button and you will download the XML file, send it to support at Pexip.com, they will activate it for you and send it back so you can complete the activation manually. In this case we'll go ahead and do the online activation. So I'll save the license key that was applied to me. The management node will reach out to the Pexip activation server and within a couple of seconds you will normally get a license rights activated successfully. So now we have 11 port licenses so this is just a small test license. So now our platform is licensed. We'll also quickly go through the global settings. So when setting up a Pexip platform, some settings apply for all locations, all conference nodes and all conferences. One of those is guest only timeout. So this is the duration a conference should survive after the last host has disconnected. You can also change the default theme. You can enable and disable different protocols. By default, SIP UDP is disabled because of the amount of spam coming in, and this is normally not used for normal SIP calls for video conferencing. If this is required for like a VoIP integration, you may choose to enable it. If you want more details on these settings, clicking Help will provide a good explanation on what these different settings do. So, scrolling further down, the link MS SIP domain is the domain used for calls being placed towards PEXIP. So, this is normally what will be after the at in a VMR address. You can set the DSCP value for management traffic, you can disable all SSH globally on the nodes. This can be useful if putting the PEXIP deployment on public IP in case you do not have port 22 blocked in your firewall. But in general, we do recommend that all DMZ deployments are put behind the firewall and you only allow the media ports to access the Pexip Infinity conference nodes and only someone coming from the correct subnet should be able to access the management node. You can also change the singling and media port ranges, but if there is not a particular reason you need to do so, we suggest to leave them as default. You can configure certificate revocation and also access to external systems and configure a login banner. So here we have also the incident reporting and the deployment usage statistics that we also checked during the installation. So that was the global settings. So before we deploy our first conference node, we need to create a location. Location is typically a logical group of conferencing nodes. So We'll add our Oslo location, so our Oslo data center. We'll assign the DNS servers that will be used for all the conferencing nodes in this location because there is no need to manually configure this for every single conference node. We'll also assign our NTP servers used for this location. If this was an internal local area network deployment, we'd also assign a gatekeeper, a SIP proxy, maybe a link server. But since this is a public DM DMSet integration, we do not need to assign those as we'll simply use DNS. We can also configure a stun server. By default, we use Google's stun server, which is used for WebRTC clients so they can find their own public IP address. 
Here you can also set the MTU size for all conference nodes in this location and also DSCP values for QS markings. If you have additional locations, you can say that if this Oslo location is out of capacity, it should, for example, overflow to your US location in case you run out of transcoding capacity in this location. If you need to override the link msip domain per location, you can also do that here. In this case, we'll just use the global one, so we don't need to enter it. If you have a policy server that does smart decisions for you, you can also configure that here. Now we'll go ahead and save the location and deploy our first conferencing node. So when deploying conference nodes, we can choose between automatic and manual deployment. If the PEXIP management node does not have access to the VMware ESXi host directly, you will choose manual deployment. In this case, we do, so we'll go ahead and choose automatic deployment to let the PEXIP management node access the VMware ESXi host for a quick deployment. If you look at the installation overview page and VM managers, this flow is explained in detail where the management node contacts the ESXi host or vCenter to upload the virtual machines. So we go for automatic deployment. Let's start by deploying on the six core ESXi host. Then we'll go ahead and enter the username for the ESXi host or vCenter and the password. In this case, I'll uncheck the verified TLS certificate so the management node will not verify that the ESXi host has a proper certificate. By cl clicking next, the Paxip management node will contact the ESXi host. If this was a vCenter server, I can now choose what data center I would like to deploy. And then I can choose what resource path I would use in that data center. So that would be where you choose your server. In this case, we connected directly to an ESXi host. So then this will be OK. Now you will choose what network the conference node will be deployed on. This is read out from the VMware APIs. So I'll choose the DMZ network and I can also choose from what disk or storage device the uh, conference node hard drive will be put on. In this case there is only one hard drive, so I'll go ahead with the default. The number of virtual CPUs to assign. In this case I'll assign six vCPUs to this conference node and then I'll also assign six gigabytes of RAM to this conference node. So there should normally be one gigabyte of RAM per one vCPU. And the number of vCPUs should equal to the number of cores per socket. The help text will help you if you need more details here. So now I need uh, some details for my conference node. So I'll uh, go ahead and check my documentation for those details. Then assign the IP address, the network mask, the gateway hostname and domain. Then I will choose what location should this conference node belong to. And this is where all the NTP, DNS, gatekeeper, SIP server, link server settings are inherited from. And if you change it in the location later, that will also be replicated to the conference node. So you only need to configure these things once. For this deployment, we'll not use IPv6 or NAT, so I'll just skip these fields. If there are any static routes that needs to be applied, they can be added here. And then you can assign them to the node. You also need to enter a SSH password, which will be used only in case of advanced fault finding. So now we've asked the management node to prepare a conference node with the configuration we just provided. And while you see more or less the first 20%, that is the management node preparing the conference node for upload. And when it moves on 
after the 20%. That will be the actual upload of the conference node from the Pexip management node to the VMware environment. So this, the time this takes will normally depend on your hard drive speed or your storage speed and also the network connection between the management nodes and the conferencing nodes. So typically this is going to take a few minutes. So now we see the conferencing node is created and then the management node is uploading this to the server. So in VMware we can now see the the conference node appearing and we can see that it's being uploaded by the management node. So as the uh, upload to VMware is finished, the deployment will stop at 96%. So this is where it will uh, stop waiting for the conference node to boot and report back into the management node. So when this is done, it will progress to 100%. And now the management node is in control of the conference node and there is no manual configuration on the conference node itself. While waiting for this, we'll just go ahead and open a new tab and deploy a second conference node. We'll go ahead and do the automatic deployment as well. And we'll go for the other VMware server, which is a 20 core server. So in this case as well, since we talk directly to the ESXi host, we'll go ahead and add the user and password, so Pexip is allowed to talk to the host. Pexip does not remember the username and password, so this is something you will need to type in for every new conference node you deploy. We'll go ahead and choose the default data center in this case, and since there are multiple resource paths, we'll just go ahead and choose one of them, and deploy. Here as well, we need to choose the correct network. If not, the conference node will not have any connectivity with the outside world. So this is a pretty critical one. You can also choose what data store, since this server has multiple SANs and data stores. You'll have to choose the right one where you want the hard drive of the second conferencing node. So in this case, since this was a 10 core server, we'll give it slightly more compute resources. So it will typically have more HD ports, then again, depending on the CPU speed as well. So 10 vCPUs and 10 gigs of memory, since this was a 10 core CPU. Then we'll go ahead and apply the settings for the second conference node. and assign it to the same location. No need for any other settings here either. So just provide a SSH password. So before we start, let's check back on the first conference node. Okay, so now we can see deployment progress is 100%, deployment succeeded. So if we go to status, conference nodes, we'll see the first conference node is now reporting back to the management node. So let's continue on deployment of the second node. So this will be exactly the same process as earlier. It will prepare the image, upload it to VMware, and when ready, it will be available for the management node. We'll not look through the entire process in this video. So now the conference node is deployed, and we'll go ahead on status conference nodes, and we'll see both our conference nodes are operational. We can go into them and see that it has measured and figured out approximately how much capacity it has available. So now both our conference nodes are deployed. So now it's a good time just to check that the DNS records, that was one of the prerequisites, is already set up. So 
So I'll check the SRV records for our domain. And I can see that Link Federation and the Pexip app is configured, but the other records are not configured. So if you see something like this, that's good a good time to ping your DNS admin and ask him to verify the video conferencing SRV records as well. In addition to checking the SRV records, it's also smart to check the host names. They seem to resolve exactly as we expect them. We can go back and check the video conferencing records at a later stage. So now the DNS is all set up. This is always something which is smart to check early on because then your admin can correct it before you're finished with the rest of your configuration and deployment. So there is one more config we need to do for each conferencing node and that is the SIP TLS FQDN. This is the uh, name that it will present when connecting over SIP TLS to another site. So this SIP TLS FQDN has to be exactly the same as the name in the certificate and should also match the DNS name. So this is the first conferencing node. Save it and do the same for the second conference node. But of course, adjust the name. So that was the SIP TLS FQDN. Now let's go ahead and upload the TLS certificates. We can upload a certificate for the management node. This will avoid getting the HTTPS warning when accessing the management node, but this is the only practical implication. So we'll skip that in this case. When you view the certificate, you can see that this is a Pexip Infinity temporary certificate, which is issued by Pexip when the node was booted. The conference nodes, however, they do need a proper certificate to be assigned to them. So we'll go ahead and replace the default certificates. You go to Upload Certificates, you will choose two files, one certificate file and one private key file. So the certificate file needs to be the signed certificate file from your certificate provider and the private key file you generated while creating the certificate sign request. So choose a certificate file. Here we have a CRT or PEM file, which is the certificate for this node. This is actually a SAN certificate that contains multiple names. So that will work just fine with Pexip. Wildcard certificate is however not allowed for SIP communications. Also choose the private key file and upload this for the first conference node and I'll do exactly the same for the second conference node. If you do not, do not have a SAN certificate you will need to have a different certificate for each node and the certificate name will need to match the SIP TLS FQDN and the DNS A record. In addition, you also need to upload the trusted CA certificate. So this is from your certificate provider. You will always get a set of a chain of intermediates from your provider. So this must also be uploaded to Pexip. So Pexip can present the intermediate certificate together with the certificates for the individual conference nodes when connecting to external sites or receiving connections from external sites. It will take approximately one minute after you upload the certificate until it's replicated to the conference nodes as with all other configuration. So now it's time to verify. Just before we verify the certificate we can recheck if our DNS admin has updated the configuration on his DNS server. So now we can see that the SRV records for all the domains are currently pointing to the first conference nodes. We'll also use an other tool to check that uh, Pexip is responding with the correct certificate when being connected to from the outside world. In this case, it's important also to specify the port number if not, most certificate checking tools will only check 
port 443 for HTTPS connections and there may be a difference there. So we'll add port 5061 to ensure it's zip TLS that is checked. So this tool in particular checks that DNS resolves to the correct IP address. It will also see who was the issuer of the certificate, the expire date, the host name which we entered is present in the certificate and here we can also see the other host names that are part of the same SAN certificate and we can also see that the full chain from the Komodo uh, validation servers etc is provided so this chain would show up as broken if we have forgotten to upload the intermediate certificate so now we have verified that we have the proper certificates added to the Pexip Infinity deployment. So now we can go ahead and go into service configuration and create a virtual meeting room. So I'll give it a name. This is also the name that will appear in link. And the description will also appear in link. In this case I will not give it a pin code. I will just provide an alias. This alias will normally work for both Link, Skype, Skype for Business, and for HT3 and SIP devices that can dial a full URI. I also prefer to add the alias without the domain, as some video conferencing vendors actually strip off the domain when they send the call to Pexip. So now we have created the virtual meeting room. So let's go ahead and try to place some calls from a couple of video conferencing endpoints into this VMR. So for this purpose I'm going to dial the URI of the virtual meeting room. And I'm gonna remote control a video conferencing codec to, to do this. So we'll take a meeting room system. We'll go ahead and dial the address of the virtual meeting room and we can see that it's connected and encrypted in HD quality. So we'll also go ahead and dial in a second codec. It's now dialed into the virtual meeting room and we can see both of them connected here. So then we'll also connect a link client so I can go ahead and add it to my contact list it will appear here right click start video call and I'm also part of the meeting so now I can go into one of the participants if I maybe want to mute one of them go into the other one mute it if I like so this is a server-side mute that the participant cannot control. You can also see the software version. So this is a former Tamburg endpoint. You can see the different media streams. If you click the call logs, you can see the different SIP signaling in the call logs. And for the link or Skype for business participants, you can also see the software version. And you can see the, both the audio streams, video streams, and also presentation streams if that's being used. So, for example, if starting content sharing to the other participants here, that will connect from the local client. And as we refresh, we'll see that Pexip is currently receiving RDP stream with content and checking one of the video conferencing endpoints. Pexip is then transmitting content to the uh, video conferencing endpoints. So that was the uh, creation of the virtual meeting room. We'll just go ahead and uh, disconnect all the participants in this case. And finally, by the end of the, this presentation, we also wanted to show quickly how to ensure that these virtual machines are automatically started when the server 
boots. So this is some uh, VM maintenance, which is also smart to do by the end of conducting an installation. So on the virtual machine startup sh shutdown, you can go here to ensure that both the management node and the conferencing nodes are automatically started when this server boots. So that concludes our PEXIP installation 101, where we've gone through checking CPU and NTP settings. We deployed the management node, went through the management node settings, we created a location, deployed a couple of conference nodes, verified DNS settings and corrected if this was wrong. We configured the TLS FQDN on both our conference nodes. We uploaded certificates to the conference nodes. We created a VMR and dialed in, and we also set our virtual machines to auto start. And other tasks would also include setting up regular backup and, and such of your platform. Thanks a lot for watching and good luck with your Pexip deployment.